Chicago. I'm Council President at Mary Spaulding, and I'm so happy to have all of you here online with us, as well as so many friends here in our live space tonight with this incredible exhibit of um, Carl Koenig's drawings that are traveling around the country and starting here in Chicago. So we're really excited to be hosting these um, as the first stop in North America and very delighted to have some incredible guests with us uh, who have, are staying with us this week and giving talks at the branch. And this is number two of a series of five talks that Richard Steele is going to be uh, presenting. And I'm going to introduce the administrator of the North American section of the Carl Koenig Institute, Deborah Grace, who is going to be introducing Richard Steele. So thank you for joining us. And everyone here, please turn off your cell phones and uh, grab breath. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And welcome again to all of you who I met last night in this wonderful, amazing, warm, and I think it was really within the heartland of of America and it really shines through with warmth. So it's as lovely to be here and welcome to all of you who are participating online. We're so glad you're here. I would like to just put a little parentheses around my introduction for Richard that I didn't know I was going to make and I need a little time to think of something to say to embarrass him. So I, what I want to um, do to do now is to say any of you on any of these evenings who get take photographs of the exhibition or on people looking at the exhibition and you think they're good, please email or text them to me because our social media people in Berlin would like to have some good photographs. And I deleted all the ones I took last night. <laughs> Richard looked like a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Sorry if anybody's Baptist here. <laughs> oh my goodness, Deborah. I just embarrassed myself, and Richard. You're a little kid going there. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> so the lecture tonight that Richard is giving is one that I think Mary uh, requested, especially because of wanting to support the Waldorf Education Initiatives in Chicago. And it is what can a uh, being human, what can the calendar of the soul tell us for Waldorf and therapeutic education today? So Richard Steele uh, came to the Camp Hill Curative Communities 50 years ago in Germany and spent 35 years um, as a Waldorf and curative education teacher and also uh, teaches in Waldorf and curative education seminars across Europe and Scandinavia and Great Britain, and is uh, someone that people consult with about the needs of various children. So all of you who are involved in that uh, field of work, Richard is a good, a good resource. I don't really know what he's going to say tonight, but I'm sure it's going to be deep and wonderful and welcome Richard. Thank you for embarrassing me once again. <laughs> but I embarrass myself too. <laughs> yeah. So um well, we're there. I can say I don't know what I'm going to say this evening either, because <laughs> I mean, uh, having taught often enough, every teacher knows you have to prepare for at least three hours when you want to give one lesson, and then forget it and go into the classroom, and then you can see what can happen. And uh, I, I I try to do that also with the with the talk because um, you know it depends where you are, it depends who is there, and um, uh, try and be receptive for the, the questions that come. So we'll see where it takes us. I, I thought um, maybe I'll start with something completely different because we have a number of teachers here also and uh, we are looking at world of education this evening. And then of course we need imagination. 
we need fantasy, we, and we have to conjure up pictures. We have to have an inner picture so that the children or youngsters can connect to our inner picture. If we talk to kids with, uh, without having the inner picture of what we're saying, then you know exactly what's going to happen. It, no, we need that inner picture. So I'm going to ask you to, now in summer, going towards Michaelmas, to have a picture of winter and a snowy landscape. And you have beautiful snow here, I know, in this area, so you can imagine it quite well. We're in the midst of winter now, and a beautiful wide landscape with a, a cold wind blowing. And when the cold wind blows over snow, it looks almost like a desert with these ripples on the sand. And uh, so I'd like to read you a poem about this landscape. Standing in awe, I see how the sunset rays on the ripples grow of the sea of glittering snow. I feel grace being here, for heaven is truly near. How near is heaven today? Was it not near anyway? Was it not I that was far away? So that's a little bit of a motto for this evening. Um, yeah, how far away are we from the heavens? And maybe this little element of awe, of wonder, can bring us a little bit closer. So when we now sit here in between these pictures for the kind of the soul, we have almost uh, a double artistic approach because the kind of the soul is a wonderful work of art. It is a work of words, of course, but it is very much also um, a complete architecture of verses. And we spoke about that yesterday. I'm not going to repeat the whole lecture from yesterday for those who come new. I'm very sorry. It would be very nice to do that, but we would need a couple of hours longer. So <laughs> I won't repeat everything. But what Karl Koenig has done here is not just to depict each verse with a picture, but also to give us a feel for these interconnections between the verses, how things weave in a, a holistic work of art, so to speak. And so it is the connections of one to the other that we see also in these pictures. And that is basically where I would like to start, because when we're confronted with the verses of the kind of the soul, we can almost say it's like when children start school, you know, because we don't understand very much, I think, uh, at least to speak for myself, they're very difficult to understand these verses. A little bit like children when they come to school and not understanding anything yet, but hearing and getting a feel for what is being told. And through this feeling, what is happening, coming to an understanding. And isn't that also the method that we try in world of education anyway? Through the connection to each other, from the, through the connection to the child, this feeling can grow. And this feeling can be deepened then to something which is a deeper understanding than just uh, intellectual understanding. And that is something which that has to do with this question of awe also, that we can or should also practice as adults, not to come too quickly to concepts, but also to hold back and to have a feel for the truth, to have a, an impression, to live with impressions, with what we hear, what we see, and out of this, to deepen our feeling, to 
a new form of understanding. So we can even say we need to digest all that we take in through our senses. And this process of digestion is learning, is understanding. And that is something that belongs very much to the verses of the kind of the soul. It's no use really to go from one week to the next and to say, well, I have to understand number one first, and then I can go to number two. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. And fortunately, the weeks of the year help us to move on and say, okay, I haven't understood number one, so we'll just go with the next verses. And next year, when that's repeated, hopefully I will have a little bit more understanding of what that means. And so this can also grow within the soul through time. And I think um, that is something which is incredibly important in understanding learning, that learning has to do with a time process. It has to do with not only a time process as you know, from class one to class five or whatever, but also in the sense of rhythms. So, and we know, of course, how important it is to do something one day, let the children forget it, pick it up the next day, and bring something out of forgetting into memory. Memory, actually, I think one can say depends on forgetting. We don't remember, really, unless we forget. And this is, uh, from my experience, something which is incredibly important for education, that we allow children to, for to forget things. And maybe we also ask the parents, don't uh, ask your children when they come home from school, what have you done today, you know? What does the teacher tell you today? And, and what have you learned? And, you know, tell me all about it. Just leave it, let it sink in, let it be digested. In other words, be forgotten. And the next day, or maybe even the next week, to let it rise again. And we know also that what rises in memory is not the same as what went in. That is important too. Don't expect that the children will produce the same concepts, the same pictures or whatever that we put in there. That would be the wrong expectation. But to expect that something has been digested, has gone through a process of change also. And that is something wonderful, I think, that the impressions, the sensory impressions, the ideas once taken in, that they are allowed to change. And through that can also change me. What comes then in memory is not a reproduction of what I've taken in, but it's something new. It is, I like to say, almost like a, well, we can say it's like something arising out of death. It's like a resurrection, if it's true memory. And it has a completely different form to it because it's individualized. So I think there is a quite a, a parallel to this in living with the calendar of the soul, that it is, of course, meant as an individual path. Not, and Rudolf Stein is quite clear about that in, in the preface to the calendar of the soul. It is not an exact, um, uh, let, me, let me take you, tell you exactly how he says this, because I, I think it's, it's uh, quite important. Um, directives are not being given in the sense of theosophical pedantry. So no directives, but he is offering verses for us to find an individual connection to. And that also brings me to the question of, of translation. And it's good that we have many translations of the current soul because 
you know, there is so much that has to do with an individual reception of what is being given. So I think uh, various translations in the English language are more helpful than just having one German translation. <laughs> because it's so easy to get caught in concepts. And these verses are not about, what well, predominantly about concepts. It's about a process. So to use various translations is even a help or to use various languages, that's an even greater help. Certainly <laughs> that's the case for me. So if my English is not so good, it's because I live mainly in the German language. So please forgive me that. But the question of how we individualize uh, content is I think very important. And particularly here, if it is to be a path of inner development, then we need to individualize in a very particular way. We have something which is objective. The verses don't change, actually. But the way we take them in changes from year to year. And I'm sure you've noticed that also when you come back to Middlemas this year, you will experience the verse differently than you did last year. And uh, if you can try and remember how I experienced this like 10 years ago, that's something wonderful. I, I have verses that I had tremendous difficulties with, like Whitson, for instance. And I thought, no, this, this can't be, because Rudolf Steiner speaks about Whitson as the, the festival of the individual, of freedom, of thought, and all these things that I have as concepts, and I look at this verse, and it's all not there. It's just nothing in this verse that reminds me of what I thought should be Whitson Festival. Until I began to see this verse in the context of the whole process. And then I realized, of course, that is this element of Whitson Festival, which I had overlooked completely by having concepts of festival of freedom, of individualization, or whatever, and I've missed out on something there, and particularly because with Whitson time, we are um, told that what has been thinking up to now must be put aside. We have to leave at least what we thought was thought, and take this path as Rudolf Steiner calls it, of feeling recognition, feeling self-recognition. <clears throat> and so it is that from Whitson onwards, we deepen this feeling so that it can transform and only after Michaelmas, so that's a wonderful thing that all of a sudden thought appears again on a different level. We leave it behind with, let me read the, the Whitson verse that I always had great problems with. Well, this can't be Whitson. The growth of senses might, in union with God's creating, dampens thinking's power to vague and dreamlike realms. No, 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 that can't be. If godly being would unite with my own soul, then thinking must abide content within this dreamlike state. So that is pretty, a pretty uh, strict um, indication of what we need to do. The way we have treated thought up to that point um, has to be forgotten, so to speak. And through this path of feeling, it can deepen and become uh, a new force of thought. That is, I think, in the question of education, not only self-education, but also education is very quite important because concepts are so strong. And uh, of course, the whole world of the media um, also force us <clears throat> into a realm of concepts very strongly. 
images that um, stay, yeah, very strongly within the soul. So we are forced really to a rigid form of, well, not only thought, but also of judgment. And that takes place very early in our time. So isn't that just one of the necessities, particularly of, of early childhood education, that we bring in this element of feeling and deepen this element of feeling so that a new form of recognition can arise. How do I lead children away from the many, many concepts that they already bring to school or into their life? And that needs to be digested. There is so much in, in our environment, in, in life today, that is almost impossible to digest. You only have to walk along the street here, and there are so many impressions, it's not possible to digest it. What does a child experience on the way to school every morning? Or on the way home in the evening? And um, how can we help a child to have a healthy digestion of these impressions? So I do think that this question of feeling has a huge role to play in this question. But I'll come back to this. Let me look first of all to a historic point. We uh, spoke yesterday about rhythms in uh, our own life and how Rudolf Steiner hoped that we would, um, in our process of decision-making, for instance, that uh, we would take time, that we use the rhythm of seven. So if you have an idea, if it's only a small idea, take seven weeks. If it's a bigger idea, then take seven years, not only for our own digestion, but also so that the way he says it, this idea, this thought can be baptized by divine spirits. That's a, a wonderful concept, I think, that within this process of digestion, also divine spirits have a role to play and can help us to transform something. So uh, seven years for something which is a, a big idea or a, an impulse we carry, a thought we've had, something we would like to realize in the world, take time about it, this is not easy. And certainly not today, because uh, we live in a time when things have to happen immediately. That's uh, something that um, probably also the computer has uh, brought on in a, a, an extraordinary manner, that everybody expects, of course, to have an answer from an email at the latest a day after. Right? At least a, a letter one could leave on the desk for a couple of days, you know, maybe mm -hmm. And then answer it. Not today, you know, you're, it, one expects to have an answer right away. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, uh, the culture today is if something is going to come of it at all, I mean, a lot of things just disappear because there's too many, there are too many impressions. But if um, something is to follow from an idea, from a thought, then it should come pretty quickly. And this is something Rudolf Steiner really warns about. How was that with the calendar of the soul? Well, the calendar of the soul was there for seven years before all of education was born. Isn't that wonderful? One could ask, wasn't that a special rhythm in the biography of Rudolf Steiner? That first of all, 1912, the Verses of the calendar of the soul came into the world. This was born in the skin voice, and it took seven years before the love of school could be born. Is there not maybe a connection there? I think actually there is. And we can see also in the background of this the um, arising of the recognition of the threefold human being. 
and of course the threefold social order. We can't think of uh, the founding of the Waldorf School without seeing it in connection to the threefold social order. That was the same, exactly the same time. And the same people were involved to, uh, to a great extent. It was uh, in Stuttgart that Rudolf Steiner gave most of the lectures about the threefold social order. And a lot of the teachers were part of this process. It belongs so intimately together and only out of a, a recognition of the threefold being of the human being could these principles of the social order be born altogether. That's where Rudolf Steiner starts, to look at the threefold human being and out of that to recognize or help us recognize how social life needs to be formed in order to be healthy for the human being. So that belongs together in a, a very, very strong way. And I think also uh, in the background of this, the current of the soul, as this path of feeling, and if you do go through these verses again and um, realize that thinking, feeling, and being play an enormous part. It's because we are used to just living with one verse and then the next and then the next. We go through the, the current of the soul in a, a spatial fashion. But if we try and have a, an impression of the totality of the verses, one can do that. If one works for a couple of years at it, then, then one realizes, ah, I heard about feeling over there somewhere in, at Whitson and at Mifflemus again. And in between, thinking is not spoken of at all. The word thought does not come into those verses. And suddenly after Mifflemus, it arises again. So, here we're told in verse 8 at Whitson, um, let, let thinking go to sleep a little bit. Uh, um, and if godly being would unite with my own soul, that is maybe what we actually want, that the godly beings can unite with my soul, then thinking must abide content within this dreamlike state. I didn't like that for Winston, but it's what it is. And then we can experience how we go from Winston through the summer period, through St. John's, and out of this experience of summertime, can go to Michaelmas, can bring these fruits of summer to uh, a ripening stage. And only after Michaelmas does the word thinking come again. I think that's a, an amazing fact. <laughs> then let me read to you the weeks after Michaelmas. Okay, verse 29. To let the light of one's own thinking powerfully unfold within. It's an interesting way that Rudrashana brings this back again in verse 29. So from verse 8 to verse 29, no more thinking. It's a dreamlike state. And now thinking should evolve strongly, powerfully within. So we see something is ripening there, and it seems that feeling is ripening to the level of thought. And to discern the meaning of one's impressions. Ha, there you go. This is the digestion of our impressions. This is now my gift of summer. is autumn's rest and also winter's hope. I think it's beautiful that in these two verses after Michaelmas 29-30, we have all three seasons. It's what we gain from summer, what ripens in at Michaelmas time in autumn can be used, can be given to the world in wintertime. Gift of summer, autumn's rest and winter's hope. And so also in verse 30, we hear, 
sprouting in the sunlight of my soul are thinking's ripening fruits. This is a, a beautiful beginning to this verse, I think. Sprouting in the sunlight of my soul. Uh, just to have this, this impression, this image, that the soul is sun-like. In the sunlight of my soul, thinking's ripening fruits. So we see how um, thinking is, first of all, in a dreamlike state, well, like it should be for a child also. Um, how do we get to that stage that we um, help to digest all these impressions, to forget also the concepts, the judgments, and everything that a child brings with it, unfortunately, in today's world? to let that go into a dreamy state, and then a new form of thinking can arise. So you see, I, I think the kind of soul can give us indications for both education, but self-education. And obviously you all know that one cannot be thought without the other because we cannot educate without educating ourselves. And here we have a unique possibility in um, experiencing this um, development of feeling, thinking, and willing to train our own soul. That's what this path is, um, the training of the soul in a way which can make it, yeah, to be a teacher. The soul can be an educator, but it has to be educated first. It's a, a wonderful opportunity, I think, that we have these two levels uh, within this path to understand what, um, what education is, but also to be able to educate ourselves in it. The interesting thing about the beginning of the Water School in 1919, these uh, wonderful lectures that Rudolf Steiner gave, and I don't know what they're called now in English, because they used to be called the study of man, and of course that's not possible anymore. So I'm sure it has a very new name. Foundations of Human Experience. Wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. So in these lectures, uh, I think, you know, we can spend a whole lifetime studying these lectures, and uh, it's something which is very beautiful because also living in time with a certain amount of lectures then things begin to blossom and things begin to grow within themselves of course not necessarily always through understanding if I look at myself but purely through the fact that one goes through them again and again and again and realizes what one hasn't understood and, and yet something can grow so I do think that Rudolf Steiner's lectures have this level um, of, let's call it art, where we can take these lectures in and allow them to grow without necessarily having to understand everything. We do know it can be understood, but we don't need to understand everything immediately. We can live with it and let the understanding grow in the same sense as this is with the verses of the kind of the soul. One thing that Rudolf Steiner does not say in these lectures is the name of the archangel of our times, Micaiah. I, unless I missed something, but as far as I know, there is not one mention of this name in these lectures, 14 lectures, without saying the name of Micaiah. You think, why could that be? And I do think it's important sometimes to realize what Rudolf Steiner did not say or did not do. There are certain things that we know he didn't do or we know he didn't say. And that is, I think, significant. And how much evolved then directly after this course around this figure of the Archangel Micaiah. So much. 
You just imagine Rudolf Steiner finishes this course of the lectures on threefolding in, in Stuttgart and goes back to Switzerland and gives lectures there for teachers in Baal, for instance, and goes to the Goethe Arnum, and there there was a report about the founding of the school. And then he gives this amazing course of lectures in autumn of 1919, directly after the founding of the Wanda School, um, called the Mission of the Archangel Michael. Directly afterwards. And that struck me so strongly, you know, that we have these wonderful 14 lectures without the name Micah at once. And then directly afterwards, the mission of the Archangel Micah and a whole series of lectures in Donach, where basically I believe the same content is brought as in these lectures for the teachers, but on a new level with the background of the Archangel Michael. These are amazing lectures. And the same content comes. He talks about the head and the limbs and the breathing process and how important the breathing process is, how important balance is. And there he brings, basically for the first time, this question of balance between Lucifer and Arima. We have this question of balance in the, the uh, lectures for teachers too, but he doesn't speak about Lucifer and Ariman there. But in Donna, he does. And there we hear quite clearly that Saint Michael, the archangel being of our time, has to do with this question of balance. But the being of balance itself is the Christ being. That is the content of these lectures. Now, this is not spoken of in Stuttgart whatsoever. And yet, it is the same content on two different levels. One could almost go through lecture for lecture and see how they fit together. It, uh, it has always amazed me to, to look at this. So for the teachers, he speaks about the guardian, the guiding spirits of our time. He speaks right in the beginning of these lectures about the necessity for the fifth epoch that this form of education should be practiced. But he doesn't say it's the age of Maka. So we have to remember how later on, of course, in the Foundation Stone Meditation, we hear so clearly, like in a crystal clear, we hear how the center of the human being, the, the realm of our breathing, of our blood and breathing, that there actually we have this, we can have this connection to the Christ being. There it comes into the foreground. We hear there about the rhythms of time in the center of the foundation stone, the second verse, how the human soul lives in the rhythms of the body and how these rhythms connect us to cosmic rhythms and therefore also to the Christ being who lives in the etheric space. That is already included in what of education. It hasn't been said that way, but it is the basis of what we are led to through the polarities that are described there and the necessity of basically healing. Now, Mary was interested to hear about education and curative education. And I would like to say there is no difference. Because if we understand the world of education properly, it is healing education. It is a healing process. And every individual, every child, but every individual on this earth, every human being needs this process of healing, of balance between, in the end, Lucifer and Ariman, but we can also say between head and limbs. And this Balancing is a healing process. 
it needs to take place in a tremendously important way with children because if we don't found this if we don't build this foundation in the first years of education then we cannot find it afterwards either but it has to continue throughout life because we are always in the situation where we need to balance. We need to find this balance between thinking and willing. We need to follow this path of feeling education. So to speak. And that is where the current of the soul um, is like a, a medicine for our times. It leads us on this path of feeling so that feeling can become the certainty of self. That is what we hear out of the verses after Nicholas, that feeling becomes a new level. Let me read you this 30th verse. So directly after coming out of Nicholas into autumn, towards winter, sprouting in the sunlight of my soul are thinking's ripening fruits and to security of self-awareness all my feeling is transformed. I think that's such an amazing statement. My feeling is transformed to security of self-awareness. Not my thinking. Remember this wonderful statement I think, therefore, I am. No. I feel, therefore, I am. If this feeling can ripen in this way. How important this realm of feeling gets for education if we realize that is the foundation of self-awareness, security of self-awareness. Okay, thinking's ripening fruits of this sunlight of my soul and security of self-awareness in the transformation of feeling, and then joyfully. It's a wonderful word in this, in this verse, joyful. I think it's sort of the joy that we hear in the, I said yesterday evening, the trumpets and trombones of the Easter verse that send us on this journey. Uh, they come back again after Michaelmas, and we hear joyfully, I now can sense autumn's spirit awakening. It's a, yeah, a reawakening of something after Michaelmas in, a, in a, an incredible way. It has to do, of course, Michaelmas always has to do with Easter. Um, it is um, a reawakening. <coughs> Out of this dreamy sleep of thought, but now something else comes. Joyfully, I now can sense autumn's spirit wakening. The winter will awake in me. In sorry, there you go. I'm back to job. The, the winter will awake in me. The summer of the soul. Is that not? The will forces that are beginning to wake in here. So we have thinking, feeling, and willing uh, arising in a certain balance after Michaelmas, and we have this joy towards the future. That is a will impulse. Enthusiasm towards the future. Um, so, you know, I hope this, uh, this movement Fridays for Future is not just uh, pessimistic, but also can bring a certain joy towards the future. That will be so important today. Joy towards the future. How can we, and I, I know that the problems are involved in it, but how can we imbue children today with hope and joy for the future? If we are only pessimistic about, you know, the climate situation and the war in the Ukraine or whatever. Um, and there is much we can be sorrowful about. And yet we need this element of hope, 
hopefully it's also a word that comes up in the current of the soul, but I won't go into that today. That will be a whole subject of its own. Uh, it comes in seven times. But we have this joy, which now can arise, so to speak, as the, the will to the future, towards the future. Now, if we remember that it is a, a very important feature of world of education that we have so much art. And uh, very often the world of school is sort of um, smiled at because well, they do art instead of learning to read and write and things like that. You know? So, oh, these stupid kids, they don't, uh, they don't have to learn proper things. They do rhythmic or dance your name, right? Um, yeah, but we have to realize how important actually the artistic uh, work is with children because it takes them on this path to a recreation of thinking within the individual. Not to repeat the thoughts of everybody else, but to arrive at one's own force of thinking, which can then develop into will impulses for the future. That's what it's about. And that is why we need art in the world of school, not to deflect from the fact that we should be learning things, but uh, no, we do art instead. But also the religious feeling that we can give to a child, or maybe not give to a child, but recognize something that lives in the child anyway, how do we cultivate the religious the, the religious feeling of a child in the right way? And I'd just like to remind you, and I'm sure you all know it, the, the words from the um, Sunday service for the children. And it, it impressed me so much in, in Campilla, we, we had uh, every, all the three services um, every week. And, I had to go to all three services, and, and for a while I thought, oh, do, do, I, do I really want to go to these services? And I was so unusual at first. And then having to go to take children, you know, after a while you realize what grows in the soul. You notice it with the children, what grows in the soul of the children, and you notice it in yourself too, I did. And um, then I began to realize the various elements that, of course, go on the wings of words, but they grow in a very different way, as, uh, not as concepts, but in this feeling realm of the child, in the repetition from week to week. And that is, I think, something of great importance, just the same as fairy tales that have to be repeated again and again and again. But particularly also what has to do with religion. And we have these amazing words in the children's service. Now, I, I've translated this myself so, because I, I don't know the English words, but um, we learn in order to understand the world. We learn in order to work in the world. Love enlivens all human work. And then we hear that the Christ being is the teacher of this love. So amazing words that the child hears week for week for week. And we realize that actually the threefold human being is not the child. It is the, we learn in order to understand we learn in order to work. And out of this learning to understand and learning to work, the middle can also grow. And this middle, which is not so um, evident, first of all, but then we realize it is, of course, this element of love. And that is where the highest being is actually our leader or our teacher in this 
love that can come about and then penetrate our thinking and our work in the world. So I just wanted to, to mention that. And we see how this the threefold human being is addressed um, on every level with education, if it is a balanced education, if it is one of education, then all these three levels are um, equally addressed. And very particularly, we need to pay attention to this, which can become love in the end, which can lead to this. And we know also um, that through the foundation stuff, we hear, or oh, we'll be talking about that um, next week. I think so, yes. <laughs> Okay. The foundation stone, we have these three parts of the human being. We have the human soul that lives in the head and thinking, in the feeling realm, in the heart, and lives in the will. And out of this realization, something new can evolve. And then we, we come to this fourth part of the foundation stone, which is why is it, why does it stay with three parts? That would be so, so much easier. If I said a threefold human being, thinking, feeling, well, that's enough, you know? But no, there are three parts and then the fourth part, which is really like a, a prayer for humanity, this fourth part. And very similarly, if we look at these four verses that always belong together in the calendar of the soul, we find in a very similar way that we have three levels that are addressed, and then a fourth one, which is, um, yeah, something which is given to humanity out of our development of feeling, thinking, willing, something new can evolve. And that is in the last verses of the current of the soul, we hear about this. What can become? Now, let me give you maybe an, an example. The, the four verses that everybody knows belong together are those four with the word light. We have four light verses. Yeah? Two that start with the words light and two that begin with the words in the light. And that's verse five. So it's over here. That's after Easter five weeks from Easter, in the light which from spirit depths weaves through earthly space, godly creation revealing. In this, the being of the soul appears, now widened into the being of the world, and resurrected from the might of selfhood's chains. These are four verses that have so strongly to do with the destiny of the individual, but I think it's um, quite worthwhile to look at this group of four verses. Selfhood's chains, that which we usually think to be the development of the individual, we're talking really about selfhood usually, and that chains the individual instead of freeing it. When we think of what of education as freeing the individual, then we want to free the individual from these chains also that um, can otherwise be so strong. The next light verse is 22, so that's just before Michaels. And there we hear, the light from widths of worlds lives on within me powerfully becoming the light of soul, so that we have this light that is afterwards, the sunlight of the soul, lives on within me powerfully, becoming light of soul and shining into spirit depths, releasing there the fruits which can ripen the human self from cosmic self in flow of time. Take our time about it, seven minutes, for instance. Right, from there, we jump now to verse 31. So we're coming towards Christmas. 
<laughs> so again, the light from spirit depths strives outwards like the sun. Uh -huh. So what I've taken within me in the Michaelmas time can now begin to work out of me. It becomes a living force of will, shining in the dullness of the senses, releasing forces that can ripen out of soul drives into creative power for human beings. For human beings. You see, I think we begin to sense already um, how work can evolve. If I understand the world in a new way, then I can learn to work in the world. And that comes very strongly in Advent, then. We hear about it. the only time work is spoken of is in Advent. And then, out of this feeling for feeling, thinking, and willing, we come to a fourth verse of light. And I would like to show you this picture because uh, it is, I think, my favorite picture. Why is it my favorite picture? Well, maybe I don't know, but we see these two fishes again. We saw them yesterday also in the pictures. The two fishes. And in this verse, we hear how light can now descend to human beings. Let me find the verse. In the light which from world heights would flow mightily to the soul, may world thoughts certainty appear, resolving riddles of the soul and gathering its radiant power in human hearts, love evoking. And again, love is a word which is seven times in the coming of the soul. And this is the last time that the word love is spoken in these verses, in verse 48. And we see how through this threefold impression of my human being, becoming human, then something is made possible, which has to do with love. I can't invent it, it, uh, it comes, so to speak. But uh, then we see how it flows in this light from the heavens. Now, why I think this is so uh, particular, this, we can look at all verses that belong together in groups of four and see how the fourth one is always a fulfillment of that very particular element. But here, this element of light is, I think, something quite special within the totality of the calendar of the soul. Why? Well, this just happens to be the birthday of Rudolf Steiner hmm. in this verse. Not every year, of course, because the verses move according to Easter, but in that year, 1861, this would have been the verse. So we see how this call it destiny in the, the verses of light actually pertain then to the destiny of Rudolf Steiner himself in these in the fulfillment. So let me now just take a, a different step because I, I would like to go back to the lectures of 1919 that you all know by heart, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, maybe you have a feeling for them. These lectures are very, very particular. And I'd just like to remind you the first lecture that we've got to give for teachers. 1919. There are four steps that he takes. One is that he speaks very earnestly about the task of education in the fifth epoch. How important that is that a new form of education takes place. That is the 
introduction, basically. Then he takes a second step. And this is something quite amazing, I think, that uh, right at the beginning of his lectures, I mean, he, that, that not everybody was frightened and, and walked away, but uh, he, he says that uh, education is a continuation of the work of the hierarchies. What you are doing with children, you are continuing what the hierarchies have done before birth. That is quite a challenge, isn't it? To hear that on the first day of your training, so to speak, <laughs> before the school opens, you know, what you're going to do is going to be a continuation of the work of the hierarchies. And may I remind you that it's exactly the opposite of what Rudolf Steiner says for the curative course. The curative education, he says, what you are doing is something which otherwise only the hierarchies could do after death. You are doing something now which otherwise the hierarchies would have to do. And it's happening now in this environment. That is what curative education is about. You see how these two impulses come together, and I, I really believe that in our time, these two elements meet. We can no longer see them as two different things. Now, this is a different sort of inclusion that we have uh, politically, the UN Charter and so on and so forth. This is true inclusion. We're including the hierarchies from both sides, from before birth and after death. And there we stand and have to continue the work of the hierarchies and are asked also, we don't have to, but we are asked to take something on, to do something which otherwise could not happen in this incarnation. And I think that this not only belongs to education in our time, but also, also to social life. Humanity is asking for this impulse now that we all realize how we stand in the light of the hierarchies, in the light of the hierarchies. Whatever we do in social life, particularly, of course, in education, because there we have the, the biggest responsibility for the, the other human being. Afterwards, when we are adults, we sort of tend to forget that we have responsibility for others, unless you know, you're know you the boss or, or something like that, then you have responsibility. But no, we have responsibility for each other. And this is something we're gonna to have to realize more and more today. So education, self-education, is something which needs to become a real factor in social life altogether. And I don't know if all of you know this, but before these lectures could take place, before the first lecture was given, Rudolf Steiner called the first teachers together and gave them something that I'd like to call a prayer. Now, this was not made public until very recently. It's been, at least in German, it's been printed now. But otherwise, you could only, I, I, I think I taught for 10 years before I was taught about this. And, and then I was allowed to copy it down, you know, now I think it's printed. But uh, he gave there this prayer, this meditation to connect to the hierarchies. Very concrete steps of connecting to the hierarchies. So this was the outset, this was the, um, the real introduction to this course. So you knew where you were going when you went to the lectures. And there he talks about quite concretely, we really don't just have to, you know, have this cloudy picture of hierarchies somewhere, but we have to work with it quite exactly as teachers and I think um, for the future in social life altogether. So that's the second step, hierarchies. The third step is that he then goes on to speak about um, balance, about harmony, harmonizing breathing. 
And this becomes the, the theme of all the lectures, basically. This harmony between thinking and willing, between head and limbs, and so on. That we practice, practice, practice um, harmony in uh, thinking, feeling, and willing, but uh, very specifically that breathing can be harmonized in education, that waking and sleeping can be harmonized. And that has so many levels. We spoke already about um, memory. That is sleeping and waking. Social contact to each other. That is sleeping and waking. It's sleeping into the other person, as Rudolf Steiner said then later on. Sleeping into the other person and awakening to ourselves. So it is very much a, uh, an element of social life that Rudolf Steiner speaks out to the teachers. Fourth step. And that is in the first in the first lecture, a fourth step, self-education. It is uh, this this first lecture, and as I say, that they weren't all afraid and, and run away, you know, but it's, it's so serious, you know. Um, yeah, you have to educate yourself, you have to um, go a path of self-development. And as I said, I think we need to include today what you gave as self-education, as self-development for curative education. I'm not sure if that's so well known to everybody. I, I just mention it now because it is something very, very special. The way of working with the hierarchies in curative education, the curative course, is this meditation that he gave for mornings and evenings. And we will find that in the pictures, by the way, because, of course, my colleague was also a curative educator. And so you will find that here. And we have this element. It's actually the sign of the sun that he gives, the circle of the prophet. It's the sign of the sun. We heard it already, how this sunlight of the soul needs to grow. And so it is in the curative meditation that we have to realize this symbol of the sun has to do with our own soul life, this sunlight of the soul, and how the blue and the yellow intermingle through the, through the movement of the realization, I am in God, in me is God. I'm not sure if the English words are this way in, the English translation, but um, in me is God, I am in God is probably correct translation. And how these two polar experiences, we can feel mornings and evenings moving towards each other, the point becoming circumference, the circle becoming point. And if you sort of ask yourself when you're doing this meditation, um, you, you come very quickly to the impression if a blue circle and a yellow point intermingle, surely it's green. And so this magic appearance of green comes around, and uh, this healing color of green um, can arise. And there, of course, we can assume on this threshold of evening and morning, the healing beings, and particularly the being of Christ, can be with us. Out of the night, this healing can be carried into the day um, meeting encounter with the child, but also with each other. So, I won't go through all the pictures now. It'll be very interesting to look at every picture and see how this progression can be found here, but um, we can't do that all this evening. So I, I'd like to, to jump actually to the second lecture because that's exactly um, where Rudolf Steiner brings the question cogito ergo so. He, he quotes up there and he says, it's false. I'm sure a number of people were quite surprised to hear that because this, um, we have to say thinking on its own 
can only say, I am not. Thinking can actually only say, the image is, or I am an image, yes, but he can't say, I exist. And that is the amazing thing that he brings in this second lecture, that we have to realize that um, ego development is something different to the true I of the human being. That is the path of the kind of the soul. What Rudolfana speaks of in this second lecture has to do with this path of being, that we gradually find our way towards the development of the true I and not to ego security. Security of self is something completely different to what we hear in the words cogito ergo sum. We have to say cognition, and this is what Bruno Steiner talks about in the second lecture, cognition is actually something which comes out of the past, out of pre-birth. It's not something new. We bring these thoughts, these concepts with us, and we are dealing with that, of course, in education. But we must realize that thoughts are past. It's something which has died, so to speak. Whereas the will impulses are things that have a reality after death. The will impulse of a human being has a connection to <clears throat> after life. So what is left over for this life? He doesn't say that in this lecture, but he does say thinking is of a previous life, a willing goes into the next life. So what is left over? Feeling is the only thing that is left for this life, so to speak. That is centrally the, the um, capacity of our present incarnation. This development, this true development of feeling, because it leads us to the true realization of self or of the true I. And we learn to say, not I, but Christ in me. That is where this path of the kind of the soul actually leads us. And it's left as a question in the in the second lecture in a, a quite, um, quite important way. Now I'd like to show you the first publication of the kind of the soul, because it's quite clear here, we looked at this yesterday already, that it has to do, we have a picture of it over there too. That's the, the eye and this germinating process that belongs to the eye because it is of the future. And the birth of the eye is something which belongs to the Eastern experience. That's why the current of the soul begins with Easter, not with Christmas. And so it has to do with this process of finding the true eye of the human being. This question that Rudolf Steiner puts in the second lecture of the teacher's lectures points to this very new concept of the eye instead of the ego. Not as the same thing. <laughs> so let me. Jump now to the development of the fifth lecture, because there, for the first time in the fifth lecture, Rudolf Steiner speaks about feeling. And it's, it's quite amazing, you know. Why is that? Why doesn't he not speak about feeling in all these lectures before? We've got the feeling and willing and how it belongs to pre-birth and after death, but feeling only comes in in the fifth lecture. Quite amazing. Well, I, I don't want to say I have an answer to that, but I, I just like to put it there as a question. You know, what does that mean that he leaves this open all this time and only in the fifth lecture does he address this and tell us something about feeling? I just wanted to, to mention that. And we realize there that feeling is actually then the portal to a new level of thing, just as in the current of the soul, 
we start with thinking, go to sleep, or go into a dreamlike state, and then new capacity of thought develops. Exactly the same we find in the lectures for teachers that feeling can become the portal for a new capacity of thought, new capacity of le learning altogether. This is the, um, the basis of education altogether. It's only in the fifth lecture, not beforehand. All these things we have to learn beforehand, and then in the fifth lecture, there it is. This is your task. Feeling. To understand how important it is. Now, he, he speaks, of course, there about how um, judgment arises or discernment, how we would like to call it in English, that actually we can only judge something or discern something through feeling, not through thinking. There we need um, uh, a balanced capacity of feeling. It's a, a wonderful word in German also because the, the word for judgment is urteil. It's a, an archetypal part, the, the archetype of whatever. It is reaching to the archetype, something which happens, by the way, in the kind of soul after Michaelmas into Christmas time. We hear about this. And this is, I think, for today's educational process, something of incredible importance. So we realize how important it is that the um, feeling capacity of the human being is able to be the judge, be the discerning element in the human being, the decision maker in the end. This is what leads to our decisions, to our will. This fires our will in the end, and not what we think, not what somebody else has thought particularly, but this uh, very new process out of being. And there he says in the, in the fifth lecture, this wonderful statement, feeling is thought, which is held back, and will, which is held back. So it's whoop, clearing the space. Isn't that important in social life altogether? That we, whether we wait for seven years or seven weeks or whatever, but that we always try to clear this space, what I would actually want to do or what my impulse is, what I think I should be doing, clear that out of the way. What I think I should clear out of the way so that something new can arise. Because only then can something from the spiritual world descend. This light which then can descend to the human being, to the human soul, that can only happen if we make space for it, so to speak. That is the birth process in the human being. So, we see the significance there, again, of art of all religious, well, if you want to call it religion or whatever you like to call it, but certainly this feeling of religious life that the child carries with it. How do we cultivate this so that feeling can be strong enough, can be um, receptive enough in the human being? And how do we do that for ourselves, of course? And I, I would actually like to bring you an example. Do we still have time for an example? How are we? Sure. You can give us an answer. You okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 One example, because I think it's very important. We look at Charles Darwin, <laughs> someone who's influenced today's world so very strongly. And I don't need to tell you about that. You, you know, of course, how strongly um, the life of our time has been formed out through these thoughts this person had in the 19th century. This person who sailed around the world and 
collected all his specimens and, and uh, already had his theory in his pocket when he came home about the survival of the fittest and how this theory of the survival of the fittest has formed everything in our society in the 200 years since, basically, right down to economic life. It has become the survival of the richest as a driving force in society, basically. I have to be sure that everybody else is weaker than me, and then I'm the best. That's uh, the way politics works, isn't it, really? Prove that everybody else is worse, and then I'm best. Not who's got the best ideas for the future. It doesn't really matter anymore, I don't think. But if we look at this individuality of, of Darwin, it is quite amazing. Uh, I don't know if you know his autobiography. For many years, it was printed without a certain section in it because his children didn't want that he'd be seen as a failure in any way. And he wrote in his autobiography a very, very um, telling uh, part. He says that as a young man, he was particularly interested in art. He loved poetry, he loved Shakespeare, he read all sorts of things, he loved literature, he loved music, he heard music whenever he could. And he said, he wasn't the brightest of people, you know, I mean, he, he failed his exams to become a doctor, so that's why he had to um, study theology in the end, because um, his father took him out of medical school and said, you know, if you, if you can't be something proper, then you have to be a, um, a clergyman. You know? That's the way things were in, in Britain at the time. If you're not good enough for, for science, then you have to become a vicar. And uh, if you weren't good at that, then you became a teacher. That's sort of the way <laughs> things went in British society. Um, so, uh, but Darwin, who had these <clears throat> problems in his, in his studies, said to himself, if I really want to do what I know I must do, I must go on this expedition. I need to prove specific theories. If I can, if I had to do this, then I, I really have to concentrate one-sidedly on science and leave everything that has to do with art. And which he does, and he, he states that here quite clearly. Um, and then he describes how he observed himself at the end of this process. And it's very, very telling. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts. You see, there's exactly this, or exactly not, this process of discernment out of feeling. Exactly not. The mind has become a machine to grind out law, general laws out of large collections of facts. Amazing, I think. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone on which the higher tastes depend, I cannot conceive. A man with a mind more highly organized or better constituted than mine would not, I suppose, have thus suffered. Question. Then he says, if I had to live my life again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. For perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied could thus have been kept active through use. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. I, I, 
you know, I sort of think he could have founded the first Bulldog School, you know? He, he knew out of his own experience what he'd done wrong. Uh, why didn't he set up one of those schools instead of putting out his theories, you know, which he actually felt were wrong? It's it's quite an amazing passage. And it's, you know, I think it's like um, understandable in a way that his children didn't want that to be known. <laughs> Only his grandchildren put that passage back in. And the letters from his wife. Now, we can't read that all this evening, but if you get a chance to look at this, um, in the, the back of this issue anyway, are the, the letters of his wife, and she knows exactly what's happening to him, and she really begs him to be aware of what is happening to him. And... Uh, just, just one line. It's, the language of the time is not so easy, I'm afraid. But may not the habit in scientific pursuits of believing nothing till it is proved influence your mind too much in other things which cannot be proved in the same way? And which, if true, are likely to be above our comprehension? Mm. That's his wife. I should say also there is a danger in giving up revelation which does not exist on the other side. <laughs> and so on. This letter was written, and of course, Darwin was very touched by it. He kept this letter all his life and left it to his children with a note written onto it. When I am dead, know that many times I have kissed and cried over this. Charles Darwin. He wrote this in 1861, the birth year of Rudolf Steiner. Why do I say this? Because this is such a touching example, I think, of someone recognizing out of his own difficulties, out of his own experience also, what is actually necessary and how important this realm of feeling is to arrive at the right concepts, but also to put them into a moral context. <clears throat> it's quite clear. So thinking and willing are transformed through feeling. That is what the kind of soul is about. That is, I think, what world of education is about. It is the I which is of all importance. And we realize that that has to go through rhythms, rhythms that we can find within the kind of the soul too. And realize that this is a very high work of art, this creation of 52 verses that connect us to this world. Now that is important that in the uh, introduction to the kind of the soul, Rudolf Steiner points out that the verses, if they are meditated, will connect the soul to the world into which it has been born. Education does this, but we need to continue that education too, to connect the soul in the correct way to the world into which we have been born. And just to finish off, I, I would like to, um, now I can't go through all 14 lectures this evening, of course, but <laughs> the 14th lecture, where does this all lead? The 14th lecture is so very special. And of course, it is a bringing together, it's a harvest of all this process that he's been through. 14 lectures, quite amazing. And there, at the, at the very end of the 14th lecture, 5th of September, 1919, um, there Steiner brings something very, very special. He brings this picture, first of all, of the human being 
with his limbs, living in the spirit. So you see, um, just as we say, the, the will reaches into <laughs> life after death. So during life, our limbs are connected to the hierarchies. In everything we do, and he says in particularly, anything we do which is um, sensible, <laughs> that's the right translation, sin erfüllt, is that the translation? <laughs> anything which, which has purpose, true purpose, connects us to the spirit, to the hierarchies. I think that's a, a wonderful thing to bring in. And he says we are when we do so, when we move, when a child moves, when any human being moves, he is uses the word paddling in spirit. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful picture, I think. So, and at the end, he says, when it comes to education, the teacher needs to develop three things. And we can see this as the motto of education. Imbue yourself with the power of imagination. Number one. Have courage for the truth. Nicholas. Sharpen your feeling or responsibility of soul. And with those words, he sent these four teachers <laughs> into their work. <laughs> of course, not four teachers, because they must have felt the strength of these words um, accompanying them into what they were doing. And yes, of course, to realize that one is only very small in the background of all this. You know? And yet, what we are doing, we are doing with the spirit, because we are paddling around. We're, we're only playing like a child, actually, when we do our work, because we don't really know exactly what we're doing. But um, we know we can train ourselves to do the right thing, and therefore the spirit will join us, will be part of what we're doing and out of this trust also that the light can flow to earth. Out of this, we can um, altogether educate children. Otherwise, I think it is a very, very daunting thing to do. Thank you for this evening and all the best to you who are still teaching. I've left this a little bit behind you already, so <laughs> and I do miss it very much, I must say. Thank you. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Uh, just uh, hold on one second. Okay. And then also, uh, if you want to ask if anyone online has any. You can um, they, uh, oh, because Miha's there. So. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. If any of you online also have anything to ask, uh, what, do you want them to type the question in? Uh, or they can they can unmute themselves and will no, they can raise your hand and I can unmute. raise your hand unmute yourself uh, when Mihai calls on you and then we'll have to take your question as well. Uh, Mark, yeah. Thank you. You said that um, I think you said this that you didn't know why he waited until the fifth lecture to mention feeling, and I was wondering what you might think of this. I think he knew what he was, who he was speaking to, that he was speaking to teachers, and two and two is four. So I think he was speaking to them on the level that they could understand and create, you know, a bond that, okay, this guy's, he knows what we're, who we are, and then he brings in feeling as the most important thing. You know, so they're already relaxed because if you tell somebody you don't know what you're talking about, they're not going to listen to the rest of you. So I think he was very strategic. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, At least I understood it okay. that yeah. way. Yeah. 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 But if you consider the depth that he goes to, and also the, particularly this introduction where he speaks very, very concretely about our connection to the hierarchies, to each hierarchy, not just to generally hierarchies, mm -hmm. but how we need to connect the angel, how we need to connect to the archangel and to the archive. And that this is the task of the individual teacher in the connection to the child, but also in the collegium of teachers. And there he speaks about the archive being, which will then um, uh, grant its powers to our work. That's pretty big. So is that your answer? Why he waited? <laughs> no, no, that's not my answer. No, I still stay with the question. <laughs> Yeah. All right. It's still okay. Question. Okay, you know, you want to go next. Yes, I I've listened to you and I find it wonderful. However, I have such a huge problem with some of it. I've been a world of teacher for 40 years. I was a world of students, and I actually come to I, I, I understand, I think I understand that what you are talking about feeling is probably there is a there is a balance there. I always, I have come to that the world of schools have much too much feelings. I have seen co colleagues go into the empathy of the ridiculous. And as a world of teacher, every single morning I ask that it is not I but Christ in me because I have so many, many feelings that I need to balance them. And I do that through my thinking and my will. And at times I'm not able to do that. I look at that and I fail. I feel, I feel, <laughs> but then it's a criticism. I think I have a world of education and I've done it for so long. I've seen so many grow up now that many of our students, including me, do not have a very balanced feeling, thinking, and willing life. And I think that it will be something the world of education might look at. I'm not so sure if it has succeeded to the point where we ought to. And I'm saying that with the deepest reverence of Otto Steiner. This has been my only thinking, um, spiritual thinking I had in my entire life. I work in the world of school, I started the world of school, but I clearly have a very different understanding of anthroposophy. And my thinking that has come out of anthroposophy seems to be very different than many of my dear brothers and sisters in this. And I see that the feeling is way too much taken, over, overtaken. I'm also Scandinavian, so there is a <laughs> But I think that the problem of, of feeling, I think that the feeling has become the problem. Yeah. yeah. We, we have to, of course, differentiate yeah. between feeling and emotions. Yeah. Mm. That's, yes, yes. Uh, and that's, that's not true. what's meant. When Darwin uses the word emotions, he means feeling, of course. But when you are saying feeling, I think many of us will hear that. Yeah. And I think that that's what we see yeah. in world is we're taking on the latest mm -hmm. issue in the world. This activism, yeah. this activist, and this activist, which is totally, I mean, activism is feeling in its best and its worst, you know? And and I think that, I think it is not harm for the world of school. Just in my humble view. Well, um, if I may just give a, a little uh, example of what could be meant. When Rudolf Steiner speaks about history lessons, uh, for the I, I taught in the upper school, so uh, that's, that was my field of experience mainly. And for uh, teaching history lessons, he says, it is necessary that the, um, the background of history has been brought up to the, the upper school so that there is enough, um, uh, what should I say, enough material there, enough experience and experience something through what has been taught in the, in the way of, of Greek history, Roman history, and so on and so forth, that when I come to modern history in the upper school, particularly there, uh, the young person has a possibility out of the description I give in that situation to know what happens. So I don't have to tell the class this happened because of this and this and this. 
but I have to describe the situation. What does that mean? That I can experience, I can feel as a young person, I can feel what was living in that time. Now, I don't come to the decision, therefore, I need to do this and this. No, but out of the time, this can happen. If I find it right or wrong, is completely irrelevant. And, and in this way, I can, I can uh, help young people to come to conclusions in history, which are quite apart from emotions. You see what I mean? It, it, it's not a question if something's good or bad. Now, we can describe the, let's say, how, how the Third Reich came to be. Yeah, it came to be. We can't say it shouldn't have. <laughs> or right or wrong is not the question in history. The question is, how could it come? And if I describe in the right way how the situation was in the, well, let's say, particularly in the 20s, but of course we have to go back further, then the young people can come to the conclusion, of course, this will happen. Not because I know it or I've heard it or read it, but because I can feel the situation. Or uh, in, in 1912, um, I, can, I can help young people to realize how this powder keg just had to explode, yeah? which so many people at that time didn't realize. People just carried on with life as it normally was. But I have to be able to teach in such a way that the, um, the feeling qualities, um, I, I can, I can uh, um, help young people to come to the conclusion of what was in history. And that is true, whether I like it or not, you know, that is, you don't have to judge things in the sense of right or wrong or, but it happened and therefore it is true. And that's what I mean, uh, just a, a, a little example, that has to do with feeling. Not emotions. I, I, I would. I just wanted to um, I'll add to that and, and uh, appreciate what you said. That I think what's being talked about is a capacity of feeling that I would call the discernment of the heart. Mm -hmm. yep. That we really come to know something out of this discerning with our heart, which is not influenced by the emotions which are pulling it this way and that, but it's this deeper centered place of heart knowing and I think that's what Rudolf Steiner is talking about with feeling and yes it has become understood so differently and I agree and I'm not seeing it happen that's what I'm yeah. saying yeah yeah, yeah. And we have a lot to do yes <laughs> how can, Brenda yeah how can we oh, yeah. speak, I'm speak sorry. up sorry. That's sorry. Why, speak, speak up okay. so the people online. my mm -hmm. question is um how can we um educate somebody when we are only feeling because basically when we are feeling we are not analyzing and <laughs> when we are not analyzing we don't know what's going on through the process so we cannot make the connection like how can we educate those who don't accept to be educated we must find a way but i don't believe that we can do that through feelings Personally, I mean, if Steiner would still be alive, I would ask him a question. Like, do you think this is this is still true? Like, do you feel like with ages and with with years, things might change, right? So, me personally, I think if if there is a lot of feeling, it's a lot of tension, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. So, I believe that through thinking and feeling both together we can come up with a conclusion. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think anybody has ever thought that we have to stop thinking, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah. how can we use, I feel, therefore I am? How do we do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the question, how how we come to a new, you say, yeah, heart exactly. or heart judgment. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, we can say that things have got much more difficult today. Therefore, world of education needs to be even stronger than it was in those days, yeah? because the difficulties are so evident. And for everybody, I think it is so difficult to imagine to hold back thinking a little bit. Right? 
like the rhythms we spoke of yesterday, if you have an idea, do wait seven years. I mean, who can do that? <laughs> <laughs> or even seven weeks, you know? Uh, and yet we can understand how important it is that things ripen. And, and so also with the child, you know, we, we can't expect that a child, and unfortunately one does expect that a child knows everything before it starts school. That is, that is uh, generally the way people say it, you know, and I've heard from parents who say, oh, this is going to be terrible if I send my child to school and they can't read and write yet, you know. Mm -hmm. So leave your child to leave these things or let it play, let it have imagination, because that will be the basis of this art discernment. You know? That's what I mean. We have a bigger problem today in the, in the right way to let our thought dream a little bit, to get into imagination, like he says here, use imagination. I have to do that when I meet the child anyway and not have my preconcept of how the child is going to react, but to be open, I, I can say from the upper school particularly, to be open every day that something new will happen, mm -hmm. to have this hope that something will develop also, and to have a joy if it does develop, you know, how wonderful that you've managed this, you know, and, and, uh, these are elements, I think, which are, are so very important today. You know, just this process of clearing away what we would so dearly like or what we think we should be doing, to clear that away and allow ourselves to sense, let's use the word sense instead of feeling, right? to sense what is the right thing. You can't teach otherwise, I don't think. Than to go into the classroom and sense what can I do today? How can I present this to the children? And with each particular child, where is this child now? And if I think about it too much, I won't get there, but I have to sense it. So let's use the word sense instead of feeling. <laughs> that, that's what I wanted to suggest is yeah. that the word feeling be have a sense for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have a sense for that's based on the cultivation and the education of that heart faculty in us, which does clear things away and allow for the equanimity through which through which the sense can arise without being pummeled by the, the other forces. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, just just yep. one sentence. I think it's so important to read this fifth lecture again and again and again. And, and uh, I've Unfortunately, I must say, I've, I've uh, done courses in with one of schools with, with collegians, and, and they will say, no, no, but that's not, no, no, that's not true. I said, okay, um, why do you think it's not true? The, the, uh, the reality of this realm of feeling, or sensing, if we want to call it that, uh, I think, um, instead of just emotions, you know, um, it's so difficult to get to that today. Things become much more difficult, not just in education, but in self-education. <laughs> um, okay, so hold on, because Ross is going to go first, oh, sure. and then you can have a turn next, David. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> to express it more in an American way rather than <laughs> English German. <laughs> um, the, the one... The one fundamental question to me is, what's the difference between emotion and feeling? And from that point of view, something that might be a workable uh, thought is the fact that um, the difference is that the emotion is always self-connected. The feeling is selfless. So what we're striving for is a selfless caring. Yeah. And that enables you very easily to actually be able to check yourself because the deeper you go, the more you realize all the undercurrents of self. 
And the minute when you can um, completely, um, and the minute when you can, when you could ideally completely get there, then you would come to the being of selflessness. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The being of selflessness is the Christ himself. Mm -hmm. And Rudolf Steiner says that in the spiritual world, it's very difficult to distinguish between Lucifer and the Christ. Mm -hmm. Kind of shocking, isn't it? No, it's not. And how do you do that? And then Rudolf Steiner comes and says, because he is the incorporation of selflessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and I think that if you think about what I'm saying, you can come to, for example, the whole human interaction that is now called politics. I love it when we always have words that are meaningless, right? Because all that so-called politics is actually emotionality, where I am involved. So... Thank you. Great. In American great. way, Thanks. I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. So, David, David. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that what Ross is is more important than what I had to bring. But it seems to me that the, the thinking and the willing, as well as the feeling, have this kind of problem. Not every impulse that a person has is their will. And a child has many, many impulses. And there's a push in, in society in America to grant all these will impulses. This is not how you build the will of a child. Yes. Yeah, right. You actually blunt these impulses till the child, by containing them, directs them to the thing that really is their will. Yeah. That it, it, it gets channeled. If you otherwise it just dissipates all their will forces just go out into in temporary impulses that they have no real. Uh, permanent <laughs> devotion to. And I think the same is true in feeling and thinking. Having having thoughts pass through your head is not thinking. And many, many people never learn the difference between this. Yes. Uh, I remember when there was somebody who was studying philosophy of freedom uh, with, in a group with me. And at a certain point, he said, you know, well, my whole life, I now realize that all I was doing is thoughts were going through my head. And uh, so what I was trying to say is I think that's a part of the dimension of what's going on here is that not every thing even that you pick up that's selfless that you pick up from your environment, right, is uh, is the, the kind of, of um, uh, feeling that Ross was talking about. And the same thing is true. It's not every idea that you take in, that you pick up out of the world is, is thinking. And not every impulse that just comes out of you is 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 your will. So trying to to discern between those things and the actual will of the child, the actual feeling life of the child, and the actual thinking life of the child is, uh, and of course this happens at different times. Some of this. But. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's interesting to see how Rudolf Steiner brings the senses into this course also, because. Uh, there we then realize how much the senses have to do with this um, sense of feeling, because the senses have also to be freed in order that we sense something. And, and uh, this is a, a huge thing, I think, also for education, um, to realize the, um, the potential of developing the higher senses because there we really need to take a step back and to cut out what runs through our heads all the time or and to have um, a perception to sense something it means I have to take myself back. I have to um, become selfless. And that's why Rudolf Shani uses the words also, I think that's, that's uh, exactly what you were speaking about, selfless sense perception. Mm -hmm. True se se uh, sense perception must also be selfless. Now, of course, we, we can't always be only selfless. <laughs> we can't always be only feeling or only thinker. Of course, we are always a complete human being, and we shouldn't sort of, uh, in some way, try and stop thinking. But 
uh, we have to realize what thinking really is. It is an act of will, mm -hmm. not something that just yeah. goes through our head. Definitely. Okay, so Question. Debbie. I have a completely different question. I apologize to everyone for changing <laughs> it. But um, one of the thoughts I, pre-expectations I thought about about this lecture was, you know, how would a teacher use the calendar of the soul? And you did speak of it in a larger context and connect it to, you know, the foundations of human experience. But in meeting the child or a child, how would one use the calendar of the soul to meet that child? So is that more in the curative realm where you look, for instance, where their where their birthday is, for instance, like you showed the, the week of Spider's birthday? Mm -hmm. um, and as opposed to going through the year with all of these children. And it's just an interesting thought. Yes. And I was hoping that maybe you would touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, the point I wanted to make this evening is actually that the, um, the path of uh, self-education with the kind of the soul is something which is very um, useful mm -hmm. for education. Yeah. So if I'm a teacher, this is a perfect path of practice. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the main point I wanted to bring. And, and to give a few indications of where you find this, that, and the other. The whole course of 14 lectures is here. It really is. And, and I think that this uh, step of seven years from the calendar of the soul to uh, the world of school is a reality. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are many, many details we could look at. And certainly, Karl Koenig, uh, I think I said this, uh, probably I said it yesterday, um, Kai Koenig worked his whole life with the kind of the soul and used it for everything. And uh, particularly for the patients he saw or every child he dealt with, he wanted to know in which week this child was born according to the kind of the soul. Not just the date, but which, which verse would mm -hmm. be there. And, and uh, this is sometimes not so easy to find out because of Easter moving and so on. But uh, nevertheless, it is very telling. And also to see that, for instance, Rudolf Steiner, whose birthday is quite close to Easter, um, that his birthday moves between two verses each year. So we do know this verse, this picture is his birth picture, right? But sometimes his birthday falls in this verse. And um, if you take a look at what's in here, this picture has very particular to do with balance. And I think it's, it's uh, quite amazing to find out. I mean, to find your own birthday <laughs> in the verses and, and to see how Tarkonik has tried to capture this moment in the calendar of the soul, um, as I say, not just depicting this week, but putting it into connection of the other verses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, um, not just in terms of education, but in education, I think it is quite important to have an idea when is somebody, when was somebody born? When do particular things uh, happen in the biography? Or uh, Kalkonik uh, looked at many, many historical situations from the point of view of the kind of story, for instance. Okay, um, so I just want to ask if anyone online has any questions. Uh, no, no questions online. And then, does anyone else here have any last questions? I just want to say that Richard is here until um, next Saturday. And if there are people either after a lecture or who would like to make another time to have a conversation with him about specific questions. Or just to look at the pictures. Or to look at, you know, have a guided tour of the exhibition and ask questions. You can either arrange a, a separate time with him or by emailing me or stay a little bit after a lecture, but he 
is very happy to make himself available to answer your maybe more specific questions. All right. So thank you to everyone online as well. And I just want to uh, remind everyone that we have one more talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central Time that is about the, um, the connections between Ita Wegman, Carl Koenig, and Caspar Hauser that I think will be very interesting for everybody. And it starts at 4 p.m. And then we have two more next Friday and Saturday night at uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. And so anyway, I hope you will all come and back again and listen mm -hmm. and everyone online, join us again. And thank you everyone for- Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's uh, refreshments downstairs and feel free to wander around the room as well. And when we go downstairs, at some point we should sing happy birthday to Mary. Yes, it's Mary. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so when I'm in bed and I want to go to sleep, she had to all the way come to judge. Can I read you a question? Can I read you a whole lesson while you're lying in bed? I don't know what you read. I'm already snoring. What do you do? Thank you, Mary. Thank you.